I always found this to be my favorite part, making the batter smooth. Cakes are never this peaceful again, what with the beating and folding beforehand and the slicing and gnawing after. But in this moment, there are no worries, no expectations. They're just cake. A quick word here about timing. In the kitchen, there are really only two types of people, the kind who peek and the kind, like me, who never do. Cakes are like a suspense film. Show it too early and you just might spoil the surprise. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Local Film Talk. I'm your host, Bob Walters. Uh, today, we have a uh, special guest host helping me out. We got Mr. Conrad Arnold of Triangle Film Community. Thanks for joining us. These are my hands. <laughs> I asked uh, I asked Conrad if he would come and uh, and help me out a little bit. It's um, I'm not the best at uh, at at uh, small talk and interviewing, and Conrad is way more knowledgeable about a lot of this stuff, knows more people in the area, so I thought it would be awesome to to get a second set of uh, eyes and hands in here and and help me you know really get some good information from people. And uh, our our victim today is Josh Dassel, who um, I heard, huh. Rhymes with Castle. Rhymes with Castle, Rhymes as Castle. we have been told. Uh, Josh, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> now, Josh, you said you are a professor of documentary studies over at Duke. A uh, professor is probably too strong a term. I do I do teach documentary studies at the uh, the Duke Center for Documentary Studies. Yeah. Okay. Can we just call you a guru? I'll take guru. Yeah, that's better. Okay, that'll work. You can put that on a business card, I think, without uh, you know, getting sued for malpractice or something. Guru is nice and tight. It fits right underneath your name really well in college. So. There you go, especially if you're paying by the character. It's nice and Absolutely. cheap. <laughs> but uh, I, I first became aware of your work at the Carborough Film Festival a few months ago. You screened a short film called Cake, which uh, if anybody wants to see it, it's online. Um, we'll go ahead and tell people where you can find it first. Yeah, uh, best place to find it, uh, head to YouTube and search for Cake 48 Hour, and uh, it will be the, the first and biggest thing that pops up. And that's that's the really interesting thing about it, folks. Uh, pause this episode, go and watch Cake. It's really great, really well done, super professional, and the amazing thing about it is that it was a 48-hour film project, which I, it's it's not often you see something that polished come from a 48-hour film festival. It's that's a really fantastic project it's, you did. It's totally solid, and, and we'll put we'll put the uh, the link for it in the show notes. Yes. Um, yeah, that that is literally one of the best 48 hour film festival entries I've ever seen, <laughs> including the ones any of us have participated in. I'm not even going to talk about any that I have ever participated in, but that cake is cake is good. <laughs> so we we mostly wanted to focus on on cake and how you put that together and how you managed to make it look so good in such a short amount of time and maybe some uh, tips you can give for people and obvi- you know what you're a- obviously able to do on a run and gun schedule um, i guess a lot of it uh, starts with what you're bringing to the project so give us a little bit about your background how you got into filmmaking what your formal education is and all that sure um, i i grew i grew up you know the short the short, long version of it is I grew up a, a on the front end of the camera, so in front of the camera, right? I, I did things as a kid. I was in theater and did all these sorts of things. And about halfway along the line, I determined, you know, going behind it sometimes was a lot more interesting. And so um, I am trained, I guess, uh, as a, a videographer um, and then uh, as a screenwriter. So my, my undergrad work at Missouri State University was in videography. I was taught by a really... Um, really uh, good documentarian named Mark Biggs, who kind of taught the basics of, of story and videography and how to use images and, and story to tell true stories. And as I worked my way through that program, I decided, you know, I, I, I like that, 
but I also, you know, all of my life I've been a writer. I've written stories and, you know, other little things on napkins and, and thought maybe I can put those things together. And so I uh, ended up um, attending and, and graduating uh, the master's screenwriting program at the uh, University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. And um, in that time, met a lot of really good people, um, really influential people in my life and my writing um, and my filmmaking, and and also uh, just you know learned some some really great stuff that has has paid off in in the filmmaking world since then. So I kind of to the table for Forty Eight Hour bring a couple of different sides of the table, a couple of different sides of the coin, the, the, the actual physical filmmaking end of things, the storytelling end of things, the having been in front of the camera end of things, and and I've got a dark sense of humor. So, you know, bringing all those things together, you end up with something like Cake. Uh, that that uh, dark sense of humor is uh, front and center in Cake. <laughs> it, 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 it is, yes. <laughs> so what got you... Uh, skipping uh, right to the chase, what got you interested in, I, I guess, how did you first become aware of and first become interested in 48-hour uh, film challenges? So I've, I've got a, um, a producing partner, um, a guy named, by the name of Ryan Witt. Uh, Ryan and I have known each other for, for years. We were, used to work together at PBS. Um, we actually made an Emmy-winning docu- short documentary together uh, during our time there when we were both living in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Um, as luck okay. would have is there, it, What is that, and uh, can people find it out there? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, well, it's going to be, it's gonna, might be a little hard to find it. It's called Cook Like a Chef. Um, it chronicled this cooking program at Penn State University that brought 11 through 13-year-old boys and girls in for a couple of weeks in the summer and taught them what good nutrition was by teaching them how to cook food and what real okay. food looked like. And so we followed that whole program and those kids... And, and kind of what their stories were for, for this couple of weeks. And, and we're lucky enough to, to do very well with that. Mm, congrats um, on the Emmy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, as luck would have it, we both ended up moving to North Carolina. We both ended up moving to Raleigh and, and kind of reconvened the relationship, the producing relationship at that, at that point and said, um, uh, you know, Ryan is, is, works in media out at Elon and so kind of has his ear uh, in things as well and said, hey, you know, there's this thing called the 48-Hour Film Festival. Um, uh, some students of mine are participating in it, and they were kind of talking about maybe they want me to, to do it with them, but, but I don't think so. I, I kind of want to do our own, and he kind of asked me, do you, you want to do our own? And I said, eh, sounds kind of cool. Why not? You know, it's 48 hours out of my life. If it, if it sucks, it sucks, and, you know, and we move on. And, uh, and that's as, as kind of the as hard and easy as it was to get going on, on 48 Hour was just saying, yeah, that, that kind of sounds cool. Let's do it. I think that's the best way to approach a 48-hour film project right off the bat. Um, it should always be more about like a team-building experience, uh, and think of it as an endurance sport kind of thing, and just have fun with it. I mean, you know, a lot of people, I think, want to run into it, oh, we're going to make this awesome mini Hollywood kind of movie in 48 hours, but there's just no way. But it's the most fun freaking 48 hours you're going to have. And, and that should be exactly what you take away from it, man. It's, it's, the, it's the filmmaking, like, half marathon or, or what have you. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. You know, you, you're, you're lucky to make a decent dinner in 48 hours, you know. So it, it come, come I'm out, lucky to burn one. Right, exactly. <sighs> so, so coming into it, coming into it you're mm-hmm. absolutely right with an, with an attitude like, you know, that we're, we're going to – we're going to throw something out there and it's either going to stick on the wall or it's not and if it does great and if it doesn't great and and let's just have some fun so yeah I I think that's exactly right okay so so was this uh this 48 hour film project this is out of uh Greensboro right yeah the uh the regional for this particular one um is in Greensboro and and the 48 hour film project and granted there's a lot of offshoots and different versions of it but the the true 48 hour film project is worldwide Okay. Um, it's 125 different regions, I think, was the, the, when we did it, um, around the globe, including places like Outer Mongolia. Um, and mm-hmm. they're having their own competitions, and all you know, and whoever whoever does very well in those competitions, then move on to another level to face the people from the rest of the planet. Oh wow! Hmm. So was this your uh, your first time doing a 48 hour film yeah. challenge? First time, yeah. Okay. So um, 
yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing looking one, especially, uh, you know, amazing looking film, especially for a, a first try. Um, so there was you and your producing partner. Um, who? What? Uh, tell us a little bit about the rest of the team that you assembled and what was your role in the project? So, uh, I, you know, I, I think these go in a lot of different directions in, in 48 Hour Film Festival. It's, it's one of those one of those competitions that is so wide open that you can have, you know, three people working on a film, you can have 3,000 people working on a film. There really is no rule. It's, a, it's okay. as many people or as few people as you want to use. And so, <clears throat> in our case, it really came down to a, a pretty skeleton crew. I mean, if you talk about full time over the 48 hours, uh, it was Ryan and I, period. Um, it, we, had, we had help uh, volunteer help uh, along the way for you know people that came in and, and uh, gripped and and you know PA'd a bit and and did a few things um, and and they were incredible help and we could not have made the movie without them um, but from start to finish it really was just Ryan and I. Okay, so what would you say you know between the people who floated in and out, maybe a dozen, fifteen people? Oh, I'd say much less. I, I think I think all told, we probably even if you include the actors, I think we made the movie with less than ten people. Oh wow. Okay. That's about right. <laughs> that, that, that's that's kind of typical for a forty-eight. Now, now I I've never done anything you know forty-eight hour film challenge wise or anything. Uh, Conrad, you've had a couple uh, experiences with that. Uh, is there any you know insight you can shed on this or? Uh, well, you know, what I'd like to know, if it's not too much of a spoiler for the people who didn't pause and watch Cake and then come back to this. And if you didn't, you have three yeah. seconds right now. One. Do do it now. Do it now. Okay, right. that was your own fault. The spoilers are on you now. <laughs> um, what was your prop? What was your line of dialogue? Okay, so I'll give some context to that. So, 48-hour <clears throat> film project. The, the the quirky part of it, besides being 48 hours, is that on a Friday night, uh, right at 7 o'clock or whatever the time was that, that you had, you had to go and, and quite literally out of a hat draw four slips of paper. And the four slips of paper um, listed a genre, they listed a prop, a line of dialogue, and a character. And all four of those had to be included in the, in the finished product for it to uh, be eligible to be in the competition. So the, the genre that we picked, um, and you'll, you'll forgive my, my butchering of French, uh, the genre that we picked was called uh, film de femme, which was a, a film with a, a strong female uh, lead character. Uh, the, I would have had to look that up. <laughs> yeah, see? Um, the, the prop uh, was uh, flowers. Uh, the character was either Chuck or Cherry Thompson, tattoo artist. And the line of dialogue was give me the bad news. And so all four of those came together, and we had to figure out something to do with those that made sense. Wow. You picked a, a clever use for flour. I'll give you that. <laughs> yes, you did. Well, when you're, when you're, when you're picking something to do with, with uh, uh, you know, what nine times out of ten has a, 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 an association with, with beauty and wonderfulness in life, uh, you kind of have to go the other direction sometimes and see what happens. Right, right. Subvert the expectations. Subvert the expectations. Yeah. So I've always been curious, again, having never done one of these challenges before, but it seems to me like the idea is that like, that 48-hour period, the whole project is supposed to happen in that. You're, you're not supposed to come in with anything ready to go. But at the same time, it seems almost impossible, especially for a group of creative people, to not already have ideas uh, lined up and stuff that they want to do. And I understand that, that that's probably the main reason why they come up with those four random things you have to draw, just so yeah. you can't be too prepared. But how do you... Well, I guess, do you? Do you try to prepare something a little bit ahead of time so you have an idea what you want to do? or I, I think... You know, obviously, obviously, everybody's got their own way of, of doing things, and everybody sort of works works well in, in in various ways. I think that coming into it without an idea is 
A, I don't think it's very smart. Um, I think you should come in with at least some sense of I've got six or seven good ideas that maybe might work if I get you know the right combination of ingredients. I, I think that's very helpful, um, right. and so so that you don't burn off part of that 48 hours you know in the idea idea phase. Um, but also I, I think if you're if you're a filmmaker, if you're a writer, if you're just a, you know a regular person that hangs around all day, you know you've got ideas already. You you've got ideas that you you think about and go, oh, you know, one of these days I'd love to make a movie where, you know, the, the dog becomes an astronaut and, and, you know, goes and murders the zombies. Like, you, you have those ideas. And you mind if I steal that idea? I like that one. It's copyrighted. Here's the see. I, I copyright it. Um, so I'm going to make a movie about a cat that becomes an astronaut and murders zombies. That's fair game. You guys are running circles around that's me. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think... I think uh, uh, Coming in with ideas, I don't even think is against the rules. I, I you know, I'm my reading of the rules. I, I think that you just cannot put in any work on those ideas prior to uh, the competition beginning. Right. They don't want you like building sets the weekend Correct. before or yeah. anything. Yeah. You, you don't you don't need to be uh, you don't need to be calling up 20th Century Fox and pulling favors and you know having the back lot ready to go. You can't do that. So. Right. So. Um... This being your first co that or that being your first competition, just to be clear, this was back in 2012, correct? Correct. Have you done any challenges since then? I haven't. You know, it, uh, we we did that one it, again. Like I said, it's kind of as a lark. Mm -hmm. um, we we did it and and had a great time with it. And and I think both of us, uh, not not that we wouldn't do it again, um, mm -hmm. just haven't between now and then. And I think probably what's what steps in there also is in the course of making uh, our our in the course of making the film following that, we both had children. So um, we, we've, been, we've been busy with other productions uh, up until now, but, but I think uh, you never know what will come back around. You're here, the first time uh, having a kid has been referred to yet another production. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that being, uh, if you were to do a 48-hour film challenge again, um, what would you do differently as a veteran, uh, that you didn't know, what do you know now that you didn't know then that you uh, a rookie mistake you wouldn't make? I wouldn't solely rely on Craigslist for anything. Um, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, dude, that's like <laughs> the most reliable, best night ever. <laughs> how, how, how dare you disparage the Craigslist? <laughs> Many I, when I needed to sell a coffee table for thirty right. bucks, I will have you know. I sold it for no more than five, thanks to Craigslist. <laughs> I, I, I think when when dealing with um, when dealing with things like acquiring talent, um, I think when dealing with things like acquiring locations, um, it's probably not the most reliable route when you only have point, uh, two days to burn. Uh, so I, I think that's a lesson I would know going in. Um, so you're saying you were posting like you got you pulled your stuff out of the hat and then you went and started posting on Craigslist. As so you're hoping of, people are going to reply. As, as, yeah, as, as, part of a, as part of a much larger strategy of, of trying to find talent. Because I, and I think maybe that's the bigger lesson, is, is we, we came into um, the, the film really not even having talent in hand. Like, okay. you know, pe people that, that were there going, okay, whatever we got, I can do it. I didn't even have that. We, right. I, we came in with, with um, you know, people we knew that were, that were on the talent end of things, and they might know people, but but that whole process even started right about uh, right about the time the clock started ticking. Right. Yeah. Craig, Craigslist is good for for that kind of stuff, but probably not time no, sensitive. No. No. <laughs> no, no. So, so did you find a lot? Of, I mean, did you luck out and find a lot of those things through Craigslist posting? No. no the, the, the like like I said, the Craigslist thing was was you know one bit of a much larger strategy, and and thankfully you know that didn't pay off. Um, what did happen was we. We ended up with because uh, there really are only two people in the entire film, so we, we ended up with um, some some really really good actresses uh, that that were um, involved in in the local uh, film and theater communities, um, and and who you know we lucked out on entirely. And and I, I say that uh, you know I have to back up a second and say I, I say that knowing that one of the one of the talent that we thought we had. We thought we had them right up until a few hours before we were going to shoot at dawn, and they bailed. Oh wow! And and so we had to, to scramble and, and find someone else to fill that place. And thankfully, we we found you know some some really good talent, including 
um, our lead actress, Cheryl Scott, who is, uh, in my mind, one of the best actresses uh, in the entire region. I mean, just, you know, region nothing. She's probably one of the best actresses, you know, around. And, and I'm, I'm very, very happy with what she was able to do uh, in such a quick time. And she's since been rewarded for that. So. <laughs> yeah, she, I thought she was good. Yeah. In that lead role. Yeah, and, and she actually she actually won uh, Best Actress at the Carborough Film Festival uh, for that performance. Well, that's so. right, she did. Yeah, yeah. And congratulations to her if she's watching. Yeah, congrats, Cheryl. Um, now, out of curiosity, like you said, you had to go in and find these people. Is yeah. there a way? Because the forty-eight hour film project is kind of a bigger thing, more well known. A lot of people in the film community know when it's happening. Is there any kind of way for someone who isn't already part of a group to kind of put their name out there? You know, like say there's an actor or actress who isn't associated with a group, can they just kind of say, hey, I'm free this weekend if anybody needs a, you know, mid-30s Asian female, give me a call. I, I, think, I think that's fantastic because somebody is going to need one. You know, with with, with a with as many people, uh, as many teams as enter these competitions, and as wide as the spectrum of what they're kind of tossing out there for you to do is, you know, some team is going to need one of everything. Right. And so, if if you are a uh, you know a, a performer and and want to put yourself out there, if you're part of a one of you know local theater troupe or you're just you know, freelancing as an actor or whatever whatever you're doing. I think that that's a, that's a wonderful way to get work, and and you know I'd take that even a step further and say, if you are any kind of filmmaker, if you have any experience whatsoever, um, and want to lend it to these productions, that you have work instantly. I mean, you have people clamoring for you, and and it's a wonderful way, um, even though you won't sleep, you know, mm-hmm. it's a wonderful way to get experience, it's a wonderful way to get a good credit, and sometimes it's a wonderful way to get a, a really good uh, you know, piece for the reel. So. Right. Yeah, if, if you have lights and some microphones, you might be able to start a bidding war. You are kidding. You are kidding. So, uh, so if, is there any kind of... If only there was a group online <laughs> for the Triangle <laughs> film community that people could post about being able to help out on other productions. If only there was something like that that existed. But I don't know. Is there anything like that, Bob? Is there? Nothing that I can think of. Uh, when you were doing this, Josh, was there any kind of platform or anything like that? Uh, probably, but was I aware of it at the time? No, no, it wasn't. And, mm, okay. uh, and uh, so, yeah. It, we, it, it, this, we, were, we were underrepresented <laughs> back then. <laughs> That'd probably be something you could put on the we could do on the Facebook page, right, Conrad? Like on the Triangle Film Community Facebook page or Yes. Yes. Um and, and in fact usually around uh May and June there's a lot of people who start posting like, Hey, we want to put together a team for the forty eight hour film project. Uh who's interested, who wants to do something. That happens a lot around that time of year. And you guys, uh, you guys are on Facebook? That is fancy. That yeah. Fancy. We spare all expenses to get our group on there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Every year, there's always people yeah. putting mm. together teams on there. So, um, valid resource. Uh, actors are always encouraged to uh, mm. post on there as well. Uh, we don't have as many actors post, but they totally should. Right. I mean, I, I always see people saying, hey, I want to do this challenge. I'm putting together a group. But I don't see that many people who are like, hey, I'm not doing anything this weekend, but I have either these skills or this equipment. And if somebody, you know, once you get going, if you need my help, you know, just shoot me an email. So if even if you're not part of a group, uh, you know, like you were saying, Josh, that's a, that's a great way to, to make connections, get something for your reel, and, you know, hopefully... Uh, you know, come up with something cool. Yeah, and let's, I mean, let's, let's take, it, take it a step further and say, let's, let's say that, you know, I, I said earlier, if you've got any filmmaking skill, put yourself out there. But if you don't have, an, even if you, you, you have no filmmaking experience, uh, you know, uh, there, there is something to be said for having warm bodies available. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, to, have, to have the experience of, of being a production assistant, you know, somebody that, that honestly whose job it is to go and get coffee for the people who aren't sleeping. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's value in that, and it, and it gets you on a movie set. It gets you, uh, you know, having the fun of doing that, but it also gets you the experience of, of working a job that, 
you know, those people that work in the business in the higher up areas, they did that too. And it's a great place to start. Well, and let's be honest, on an organized film set, if you come in as someone without a lot of experience as a production assistant, you're going to just be doing the standard production assistant jobs. But if you can get in on a 48-hour film project, there's no telling what you might end up getting to do. You might end up in front of the camera. You might end up operating the boom. Who knows? So... And it's a 48-hour film festival project where, you know, they, they, they're only eight minutes long at max. And so these things, you know, they, they've, they've got stories that really have to push along. So somebody ends up dead in nearly all of these things. So you, you could play a dead body. You mm-hmm. can play. And if, you know, if you're holding that boom and the tip of it starts to get down in the shot, you are not going to get reamed a new one for that. It's, well, you might because everybody's might. tired and cranky. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the end of the world like on a high-end uh, project or anything. Right. So back to cake, um, and just how freaking good it looks. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting camera angles. At one point, there's a shot from inside an oven. Uh, I noticed a lot of dolly shots. That is normally the kind of thing that requires a lot of setup and a lot of prep, which is the one thing you don't have a lot of on a 48-hour project. So talk a little bit about how you were able to get some of those higher-end production values and things that normally take more setup on such a tight schedule. I I think it comes down to, to, I was going to say two, but it's probably three. It comes down to three three, uh, things, and one of them is uh, just the talent, honestly, of the cinematographer, um, of of Ryan, who is the the cinematographer and the editor on this, and just how freaking good he is. It's a testament to him. Um, I, I think a lot of that, though, comes from he and I coming from the documentary world. You know, in, in the documentary world, you're, you're catching things in real time, and so that means move quick. Because uh, if you don't move quick, you don't get it. And right. so, so having had the experience of, of shooting things in motion that are real that, that we can't redo, um, but having to shoot them in such a way that, that you know, they, they don't look like junk, you know, uh, that, that they look well, it, it, I think that really plays into that skill set. And and so that I think that helped us quite a bit. I, I think finally though is the you know we talked about the inventiveness of the the some of the angles and some of the interesting shots that aren't necessarily your standard shots. Uh, part of that is sleep deprivation. <laughs> you know after after a while you go okay we got to do something to keep ourselves awake and keep ourselves interested. What can we do? Oh yeah, let's stick the camera in the oven. Well, that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, it, it is. We've said it before, but it's very, very true. You know, it's it's two days out of your life, and so this is the time to go nuts and okay. do all those cool things you ever wanted to try. And if they work, they work, and if they don't, they don't. Okay. So, I mean, what now? What were you using for some of that stuff, like the dolly and everything? Was that just a little slider? It was a slider. Yeah. Um. It it was uh just a little rail slider on a tripod and uh, a nice steady hand, and and that's all you need for. For a, a good dolly shot, and, and and also you can we you know I think there's one shot in there where the main character is you know walking past uh, as the as the the camera is is dollying like that is tracking, and you can you know a rail slider doesn't give you much it gives you a little mm-hmm. bit not much but you can kind of trick it a little bit and you know using particular lenses and getting something to move past the camera while the dolly is moving sort of creates that feeling of separation. Um, and makes the move feel bigger than it actually is. Right, right. Okay. Now, what what kind of camera were you shooting on? We were at that point. We were shooting on a Blackmagic Cinema camera. Oh, okay. Yeah, you got a, a really crisp image out of that one. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a good camera. It's a good camera. Okay. Any other uh, questions you had, Conrad? I need to check my notes. Um. Let's see. And love the ball to Conrad, who is. Not paying attention. Wait, what? What? Oh my God! What are we doing? Conrad, put away Monument Valley. We're doing a show here. Well, here I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you the. I'll give you the quick funny anecdote. You want the quick funny anecdote? I was going to ask about anecdotes in a minute. Okay. Yes. Um. So here's here's quick funny anecdote, which is after after you shoot all this stuff, the shoot the shooting's easy, right? The shooting's mm-hmm. just set up the camera and shoot it. After you shoot all of this stuff, you have to edit it. Well, by the time you get to editing it, you have nearly hours left before you have to be done with this thing, and and there's potential uh, reshoots or or other things that you might have to pick up the next morning before you have to turn all this stuff in. 
So by the time you start editing, you're delirious. And mm -hmm. and that's kind of how we were. And, and it was it was just Ryan and I. Um, we are sitting in his living room with the laptop, and we made a deal and said, uh, you take the first shift, and you you edit you know a couple of minutes. You know, I'll I'll start and I'll sort of boxcar things together, and then you go sleep, and then he goes and sleeps for a few hours, and then he stands up, he comes in, he sits down, he fixes all my edits, and I walk back and sleep in the exact same spot that he was just sleeping, and so we we sort of do this rotational thing, and and in addition to that, you know, we're building sound booths in his bedroom with with uh, 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 sound blankets and, and C-stand arms and, and trying to do voiceover recording because the cake has a lot of voiceover in it right. um, to get that nice, that nice intimate feeling. And then at the same time, we're both panicking because sunrise is coming and we have uh, uh, reshoots and additional stuff that we've got to shoot in the, in the morning in order to finish the, the silly thing. And then we've got to edit that stuff in. So um, just having that, that sort of, you know, one person lays down, the other person stands up and comes and edits for a while. Uh, was it was funny to I'm sure it was funny to watch it wasn't funny at the time mm -hmm. uh, but it's funny to look back on. So so uh, give us some examples of what was some of the stuff in there that was done through reshoots. Uh, was it mostly the B roll? It was yeah some of it was the um, I, I don't know that we did a lot of reshoots I I, I think some of the maybe the close ups um, on the the flower prop um, that were in there needed to be done uh, again. Mostly what it was was I it was. Uh, an additional scene that really just in the course of the day, you just we didn't have time to get to it, and and without it, it wasn't going to work. And and it was the pivotal scene or a pivotal scene where she is our main character is is explaining, uh, you know, the logic behind doing what it is that she's doing, and and how how things have been passed down for generations, and this is how things are. And so right. without that explanation, the story doesn't work. And so. So we're we're panicking because you know sun's coming and we we got to do this and then we got to edit and we got to get it all the way driven back to Greensboro and, and turn the thing in. So uh, it was you know it, your hair's on fire for a few hours. But, oh, you, you gotta know. you gotta love that last panic hour long drive. <laughs> right, going back to documentaries, man. What, what's your what's your like top three documentaries? Mm, oh man, okay. I don't or know. Better yet, who, who who who's your directors? Who's my directors? Well. I'll, I'll kind of combine the two questions because I'm I'm gonna I get bad at names, but I can tell you films. Um, the probably in the last several few years, my favorite ones or some of my favorites that come to mind um, was a film called The Imposter. Okay. Um, I don't know if you saw it. It, it was a, a a story about a, a kid from 10, I don't know, 10, 12 years old or something from middle of nowhere Texas who disappears. Mm -hmm. And about four years oh, later, shows Disney back up yeah, yeah. in Spain and doesn't know, d doesn't remember English, only speaks Spanish, and doesn't remember how he got to where he was. And the the movie is not only about him being reintroduced to this family that he was taken from, and having them all having to figure out how to work together and and what happened because he won't tell them what happened. Um, but it's it's also shot in such a way that there are these really, really incredibly well-done cinematic reenactments of things, um, of, of uh, different pieces of the story, and occasionally the actor uh, turns and, and breaks the fourth wall and talks right to the audience. And so hmm. it, it's, a, it's a really weird kind of documentary, but really, really well done. Um, I'm also a fan of the Paradise Lost uh, series. The trilogy? The trilogy, Yeah. And, you know, I I got into that. I can remember seeing the, I can remember seeing the previews for that when I was a kid on HBO. Just seeing that mm -hmm. there was a documentary and it looked kind of creepy and but and at, at the time I didn't care anything about documentaries, so I didn't watch it. But later in life, getting into that and then following that story through those three movies and watching the evolution of what happens with you know guys who may or may not be guilty of murder, you know that was sort of the precursor of things like the Jinx, you know, and and uh, uh, making a murderer, which is on Netflix right now. You know? Um, and probably the last thing I'd mention, just I, and I, I mention it to my students as well, is I think that some of the best documentary filmmaking, period, across the board, is being done by ESPN. I think ESPN's 30 for 30 series um, is some of the best filmmaking, I, documentary filmmaking I have seen, period. Mm -hmm. And 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 there there are particular ones in there that are done better than others, but they take a story that has to do with sports. 
uh, maybe even in a tangential way, and and tell it as best they can. And each of each of these different thirty films that they do every time they do a series is done by a different director. And so it's it's a wonderful way to get introduced to uh, uh, some really great documentarians and some really great stories. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I've, I've heard that series is really good. Yeah. In fact, I've even heard there's some really good parodies. I hear there's a good thirty for thirty on Space Jam out there. <laughs> I've watched that. <laughs> I um, oh, what was the last one I saw? Uh, that that uh, Werner Herzog one, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Of Forgotten Dreams. I think it was. He does he does some really good uh, documentaries too. He does absolutely. Yeah, he's he's wonderful, and and uh, and of course. Uh, 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 oh gosh, there goes the name again that I'm going to forget. Thin, thin blue line, fog of war. Errol Morris. Errol Morris. You know, yeah, yeah. if you're if you're watching documentaries and you you haven't seen an Errol Morris documentary, it's it's like listening to music and not hearing Mozart. Yeah, I mean it's it's <laughs> he's great and and teaches me something every time I watch him. Not the least of which is how to effectively conduct an interview with someone who's looking directly at a camera instead of to the side of it. Um, right. That, that, what, what does he call that? The uh, the, the interrotron. Interrotron. Yeah, yeah, that is great. I mean, wow. that, that is a, that's a frightening sounding name for something. You know, that's that's the you know sort of East German light bulb above your head, long needle sort of thing is what I picture when I hear. Didn't oh, God. didn't Morris make a living for a while as a PI? Did he? Yeah, I think he did. Um, Makes sense. Like back in the eighties or so. Yeah. So you know, maybe maybe that game just came about because of, of you know the PI background. See, if you got the skills, just bring them to the table. You never know how they're going to work in uh, making a film. So speaking of which, what are some things that you've learned from these documentaries and, and others and fil- uh, filmmakers that you're a fan of? Uh, what are some things that you learned that you use, like not just for cake, but just uh, techniques you learned for filmmaking in general? I, I am, I think, above all interested. I, I mean, it, how a film looks is important. Um, but I think the story really is where my interest lies in most films, documentaries and narrative films. Mm-hmm. Um, if, it, if, it, if it's not a tight story and if it's not something that, that feels real and moves at a certain pace and takes me somewhere, I, I lose interest. And, and, so, and that may be why I'm, I'm you know, not a fan of you know, Fast and Furious movies and, and uh, <laughs> those types of things uh, too often, but... I got, I've got my ones I like. But uh, I think story is something that I'm, I'm really, really interested in and, and finding ways not only to uh, tell stories in traditional ways but to tell them in non-traditional ways. And, and I think what I've learned um, from watching movies, from making movies, and, and from studying under some really, really talented people um, is, you know, it's, it's the old adage and it's absolutely right, which is, know the rules before you break them, right? So going into a film and saying, I'm going to do something new and different that no one has ever done, it's a losing game. Everything has been done. Every story has been told. And so, you know, telling it in a new and different way, that, that's the job of the filmmaker. But, but telling it in a different way for the sole sake of telling it in a different way is not always the best idea, and it is not always going to come out with, with what could be a strong film. And so I... I teach my documentary students, uh, and, and I, it's, in, it's 100% applicable for narrative, it's probably even more so for narrative, that even though it gets panned, I think looking at something like three-act structure, I think looking at something like uh, eight-sequence structure, any, any of those uh, you know, the screenwriting structures that exist that kind of help you as training wheels to you know, hang this scene here and hang this scene here so that they make sense, I think that those are wonderful places to start, and and uh, once you learn them, then you can throw them out the window and, and do whatever the hell you want. But right. but learning them, I think, is very very important in order to make yourself a better screenwriter, not just a screenwriter who writes more. Right. Well, I mean, the thing is that you know th- those tools are there for a reason. You know, the reason that you know movies are the way they are. You know. A payoffs and genres and that kind of thing is because you know a hundred years of people working on this stuff have have come to fa- find that that's what works. You know, it's uh, you know it's like scientific theory. You know, experiment, 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 and see you know what works most often. And you know, if you're not going to do that, if you're going to do something different, 
you know, like you said, you're only going to shoot yourself in the foot if the point is to break the rules. You break the rules because the rules weren't working for you. You have to be telling a story, and it just so happens that that three-act structure isn't going to work for you. If you go into something saying, I'm going to come up with a story that doesn't do three-act structure, then you're just fighting a losing battle. Yeah, and, and, you know, and there there are, you know, e- even, the, even the, the most... Uh, even the people that bend those rules the most, I mean, the Tarantinos of the world and, and you know, the, uh, the, the Scorseses of the world, even they, in that convoluted universe and craziness that they're doing, even they are telling you where something starts, where it goes, and where it ends. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and they're doing it in, a, in an inventive way, and they're doing that effectively, but they are doing exactly what all of these structures are teaching you to do, which is start me somewhere, take me somewhere else, and end me in a third place. Right. And, and and I think that that's a, a great way to tell stories. Right. Well, it's like it's like musicians, you know. It's like uh, you know any guitar player in the world. How no matter how good they are, how inventive you are, you go hang out with them in their spare time. They're sitting around playing scales. Yeah. Because I mean, you you got to know that stuff. You got to master that before you can go and do crazy shit. Ab- absolutely. You know, and you can you know playing you know playing playing movies like you play prog rock. You know, it works for some people, but you're going to limit your audience, right? You know, you right. You, just, you just keep evolving with no end, and it. it some people will like that. Not a lot will. Right, right. So uh, let's go ahead and finish up. Um, I'm stepping on my cord here, yanking my mic around. Uh, so let's go ahead and finish up on cake. Um, you actually won the 48-hour film challenge in Greensboro that year. Um, what have you done with it since? Because I was not aware until talking to you and Conrad earlier about this. I thought. That was it. You know, you win the one in Greensboro or whatever your local one is, and that's it. I guess if you want to take it and send it to festivals, that's, you know, that's up to you. I didn't realize there was a hierarchy. So tell us a little bit about how that works and what you've done with Cake. Sure. Uh, yeah, Greensboro, <clears throat> pardon me, Greensboro for, for uh, the competition that we entered is really just a regional competition. I say just. It, it's a regional competition. And the, the 48-hour film project is worldwide. So in the year that, that we entered it, there were about 125 of these regional competitions taking place over the course of the year around the planet. And, and you know, many of them were here in the U.S., but a lot of them weren't. You know, there, there were Japan and Australia and Outer Mongolia and, and you know, the Tahitian Islands it all have their own regional competitions. And so uh, Greensboro was ours, and uh, we ended up... Uh, Doing very well there, and and you know winning best film and best director and best uh, best writing and best sound, um, uh, with an honorable mention for our, our actress. And so by by virtue of winning best film, uh, we were then elevated to phase two of the 48 hour uh, film project, which is called Film of Palooza. Uh, okay. Film of Palooza is uh, sort of the finals of the 48 hour film project, and it brings together the winner of each one of these 125 places from around the world and uh, puts them in competition against one another. And in the year that we did it, the uh, Film of Palooza took place in Hollywood. Um, we had the, the benefit and the pleasure of having Cake screened uh, not only for a Los Angeles audience, but actually being screened on Hollywood Boulevard at uh, the Man Chinese Theater complex, you know, where all the handprints are in the, yeah. in the sidewalk and the stars. We weren't in the big cool. theater, you know, we were in the theater beside it. But, but still, you know, I, you know we, we have the, the, the privilege of saying that we had a film that was shown on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, and no, that's it, very it cool. cool. And, and so we went in competition against all these other people from around the planet, and there were some, some really uh, amazing films. I mean, like, super amazing for 48 hours. Uh, Super, super amazing, even if it wasn't 48 hours. And right. and it's it's kind of humbling to look at your own film and go, yep, we did pretty good, and to walk in and look at those and go, holy cow, how did they do that? Um, it, it was cool. It was great. And we, you know, it ultimately in the end, you know, we didn't end up, you know, winning the planet, um, but but we did all right. And and uh, and I think it was a a team from. France. Can't remember if it was Paris or not, but it was a team from France that ended up winning uh, with a dark comedy, so kind of along the same lines as us. And uh, they had we we had a crew of five or six, and they had a crew of I think when we counted in the credits, they had a crew somewhere north of two hundred. 
Holy wow. shit. Wow, that is huge. It's a, it's a little big. <laughs> Must have had a lot of crowd shots in that one. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that was all crew. That was all crew. Wow, that is crazy. Is there any way you know that you know of that somebody could go back if they wanted to see some of those? Does like film? Is there like a film of Palooza site where people can see the different entries? There is, and, and whether they maintain the actual films themselves, I, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. But if you, uh, the Forty Eight Hour Film Project maintains a uh, a Facebook presence, and so does the, the one in Greensboro does, and, and nationally they do, and you can get to Film of Palooza uh, through that. So that, that's kind of a wonderful way to get to it. Um, you can also search direct. Go to YouTube and search for uh, 48 hour. Nobody knows Film of Palooza outside of 48 hour film project <laughs> sometimes. So type 48 hour film project and, and the year. So 2012 in our case, 2013, 2014. And a lot of people who have posted theirs will post it with those keywords and you'll be able to, to see a lot of those films. And you can get the list of who the winners were um, from the, uh, the 48 hour project uh, film site. Okay. Now, obviously, we saw Cake at the Carborough Film Festival. Uh, what else have you guys done with it? Uh, so Cake has actually been somewhat dormant uh, for, for the past couple of years for the reasoning of whenever you participate in the 48-hour film project, um, you actually have to sign on a dotted line that says that for a certain duration, uh, the 48-hour film project is your co-producer and that therefore they, they maintain certain rights to it for a limited period of time and they ask politely that you not you know, show it outside of, of certain venues or if you do you have to follow certain rules and so we've, we've allowed the film to kind of expire those rules and, and now that those uh, have expired we're taking it back out into the world and so Carborough really was its, uh, its grand re-entry uh, into the world of, of competition and otherwise and, and so we're, we're looking at 2016 and, and where we think it would fit best, and I'm excited to see where it goes. Okay, well, it got a nice. really great reception there. Yeah, I, 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 I heard it was wonderful. I, I was not able to attend, unfortunately, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I heard that the, the reception was great, and I appreciate everybody going to see it. Now, I, I'm, I am curious, because it's uh, a movie from 2012, and it's, you know, this past Carborough Film Festival was 2015. While we're taping this, is now 2016. But does it hurt your chances of getting in festivals? The fact that the movie's three years old. Most festivals want current stuff, right? Yeah, it could. It, it could. Um, depending on the festival. Again, I mean, and, and festivals are um, thankfully and not thankfully. There's a lot of them, and and so there's a lot of festivals looking for content. And and so some of your your bigger festivals, you know, we're not we're not, probably not entering it in Toronto, you know. Um, but or Sundance, but but some of the the mid majors and 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 below um, are looking for content and they're looking for films to show and so um, cake having uh, you getting cake into those types of festivals I I think is is still possible and I think that, that cake is doesn't date itself and so um, right. I, I think it would play very well with an audience in 2016 as well as it would play with a 2012. Okay. Did you have uh, any, any other questions you wanted to uh, yeah, Conrad? I know I know you had a, a list of stuff. Uh, I, was, I, I was I was you're just I doodling. Was, I'm doodling. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, again, and congratulations on Cake. Uh, I think it's a fine short film, and uh, get it out there, man. Yeah. I I appreciate that, man. Thank thank you so much, and and every everybody look for. Uh, our, our next production is called At Dusk, and uh, it will be out there in the world for you to have a look at uh, hopefully sometime this year. Okay. Nice. Well, awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, this was uh, Josh Dassel, a uh, filmmaker whose, uh, whose film Cake was in the 48 hour, or won the Greensboro 48 Hour Film Project and uh, just recently got back out on the festival circuit. So if anybody out there uh, has the opportunity to go see it, uh, if he happens to enter it into, say, Film Spark or Longley Film Festival here in Raleigh, I highly recommend going and checking it out there <laughs> <laughs> or anywhere else it's showing. Um, where, can, uh, where can people find you online? Um, you know, you're, are you on Twitter or you got a website, that kind of thing? Uh Probably I, you know, I'm 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 a bit of a uh, I'm I'm a bit of a, a hermit and a luddite when it comes to social media and technology. So no, you can't find me online. <laughs> um, 
but if you're if you're interested in in seeing some other things um, uh, that I've been a part of before, and and also as other films and projects become available, um, I I do have a Cargo Collective site. So you just go to cargocollective.com slash j dassel. That's J D A S A L. Mm -hmm. And just check down in the show notes. We'll put a link uh, link there, folks. Um, and yeah, keep an eye on what Josh is doing, because if cake is any indication, there's a lot more cool stuff to come. Thanks, sir. Uh, so this has been Local Film Talk. Uh, I'm Bob Walters. You can follow me at, at @paradisebob on Twitter. Uh, my newly minted co-host, Conrad Arnold. Uh, where can people find you and your work? Uh... I would just suggest everybody watching this go to trianglefilmcommunity.com because that's that's all I care about. Mm -hmm. And the I, I, I'm, I'm on a Twitter account. There's, we got a website, we got a Facebook group, we meet every month, and uh, by all means, check that out. Mm -hmm. And maybe right, that's, you get to cool people like Twitter. Josh and uh, and the projects they're working on, or meet other folks that are doing that are trying to put together groups for a 48 hour project. Yes. And who knows? You too might get to play a dead body. I did. <laughs> oh man. So um, as for local film talk, of course, if you're watching the video, it's probably on YouTube. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we also have the podcast. You can go to iTunes and search for local film talk. Uh, local film talk is also the Twitter account at local film talk, and you can also find a lot of our stuff, especially the back catalog over on TriangleLife.tv. But that pretty much does it. Uh, thank you both, you guys, for being on the show. Um, I hope to have you both on again. Uh, you, Conrad, especially soon, like next freaking week. What, next week? <laughs> Where we have Anthony Williams. Yes, Anthony Williams. Um, is supposed to be our guest next week, so I'm looking forward to that chat. And Josh, of course, you have uh, an invitation to come back on anytime you want. We'd love to hear, uh, you know, if you've got another project you want to talk about or just any kind of subject. Um, documentary stuff is not something we get to chat about much on the show, so if you ever want to chat documentaries, just uh, let us know. We'll get you back on. Anytime. Cool. All right, folks. Well, I hope you had a good time. We look forward to seeing you next week, uh, and until then, take care. Take care.